Here is how Rupert Murdoch, the head of News Corporation, which is Fox News' parent company, here's how he described President Trump's election conspiracies just a few days after the 2020 election. And I quote, BS and damaging. Murdoch went on to say that some Fox News hosts didn't just give airtime to Trump's election fraud conspiracies, they endorsed them. That is all according to newly unsealed court documents in the ongoing $1.6 billion Dominion Voting Systems defamation lawsuit against Fox News. After already learning that in private, Fox News hosts called the election fraud claims total BS, we now have evidence that that belief was also held at the very top of the media empire. And a once invincible media mogul is now finding himself and his empire under assault after a series of bombshell revelations courtesy of this ongoing litigation. This latest filing shows us the unprecedented and unusually cozy relationship between Fox News and the GOP. For starters, we learned that during Trump's campaign, Murdoch provided Jared Kushner with confidential information about Joe Biden's ads and debate strategy before those Biden ads were to become public. That coziness extended well beyond the former president's inner circle. There was also Murdoch's relationship to top Republicans in Congress. Murdoch testified he called then-Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell immediately after the election and told investigators that it was, quote, probably true that he, quote, urged the Republican leader to ask other senior Republicans to refuse to endorse Mr. Trump's conspiracy theories and baseless claims of fraud. While Mr. Murdoch was in close contact with the highest levels of the GOP, he also privately did not want to, quote, antagonize Donald Trump. And then the media mogul ran into a big problem. The court filing details how, following Trump's election loss, the head of Fox News' brand protection unit, he told Fox executives that the network was, quote, underwater with viewership declining. Rupert's son, Fox Corporation Executive Chairman Lachlan Murdoch, testified that the drop in viewership would, quote, keep him awake at night. Confronted with polling showing Fox's drop in favorability, executives were warned that, quote, clear and decisive action was needed to regain the trust that they were losing with their core audience. And so while Fox News chief himself believed Trump's claims of election fraud were total BS, the network continued to allow consp election conspiracy theorists to spread disinformation all over its air. According to Dominion's filing, that was motivated in large part by profit. This is NBC News with a summary. Murdoch asked why he continued to allow MyPillow CEO Mike Lindell to make election fraud claims on Fox News, said it was a business decision. It is not red or blue. It is green, Murdoch said, according to the court documents. Fox News has said the lawsuit is baseless and is an all-out assault on the First Amendment. I have a big legislative session coming up. I made promises to the folks about what I would deliver, and we're going to deliver a lot of wins over the next few months. And Florida Republican lawmakers are not wasting any time getting started. They have filed a bill today that would expand on the so-called don't say gay bill. It would restrict the use of pronouns in schools by requiring them to match the assigned identity of the person being described. They have also filed a bill that would eliminate the state's Democratic Party by directing the Florida Division of Elections to immediately cancel the filings of a political party to include its registration and approved status as a political party if the party's platform has previously advocated for or been in support of slavery or involuntary servitude. And that is because Southern Democrats, of course, advocated for and defended slavery during the Civil War. It's not exactly clear that these specific bills are backed by Governor DeSantis, but at least some Florida Republicans seem to think that in the current atmosphere, it's worth putting their names on them. And they come as the impact of other DeSantis actions are beginning to take effect. This was the campus in a new college in Sarasota, Florida, earlier today, before a board of trustees meeting. Students gathered in protest over the six new conservative members who were appointed by Governor DeSantis earlier this year. Hours after that protest, the board voted to abolish the school's diversity, equity and inclusion office and to end its mandatory diversity training program. Just yesterday, Governor DeSantis capped off his plan to punish Disney World for speaking out about his don't say gay bill by signing a bill into law that revokes Disney World's self-governing status. 
It allows DeSantis to appoint his political donors, including the co-founder of the conservative group Moms for Liberty. He can appoint them now to a five-member board that will be responsible for the government services that district provides in its theme parks. The board will oversee infrastructure projects like road maintenance and sewage treatment, which all sounds, you know, fairly normal. But the Washington Post notes that Governor DeSantis has another use in mind for this board. DeSantis suggested Monday that he is also expecting the board to act as a sort of moral arbiter for the company DeSantis has described as a woke Burbank corporation that is trying to inject woke ideology on children. Disney World. Joining us now is Florida State Representative Anna Eskimani. Uh, Representative Eskimani, thanks for joining us. I know you've been very involved in all of this uh, or at least the pushback on a lot of it. Let's just first start with with Disney and the degree to which you think the governor is trying to weaponize state oversight to effectively cancel Disney culture, as it were. Well, thanks so much for having me, Alex. And so much of what Governor DeSantis does is fake populism. You know, as he talks about ending the corporate kingdom, he's been giving out billions of dollars in tax breaks to some of the state's largest corporations, Walt Disney World included. He's done nothing to close corporate tax loopholes. In fact, I have filed legislation to do just that. And at this point, Republicans have not committed to give me one hearing. In the case of Reedy Creek, I mean, the governor's ability to appoint all five members, and as you noted, feeding into extremism while also crony capitalism just highlights that he really isn't a guy that's tough on corporate actors. He actually just wields culture wars to his favor while continuing giving corporations the tax breaks that really they care the most about. I mean, can I just say, I, I, and I, this seems like a detail, but I think it's important. The governor was married at, at Disneyland, right? The, the, the mouse looms large in the state of Florida. And I got, I got to ask you, as a Floridian, I know that he's he's sort of ca framing this as as a man versus a corporate me megalith, but Disney's pretty popular in the state of Florida, isn't it? I mean, how does this play with residents of the state that he's the governor of? Oh, absolutely. It is not something that locals approve. In fact, when you talk to Disney workers, overwhelmingly, uh, they're concerned about the new five-person board, especially knowing just the extremism of some of the members. I mean, the new chairman is a mega donor to DeSantis. He's given him $50,000 just a year ago. And so you talk to everyday workers, you know, they want to love who they want to love. They want Disney to continue to support issues pertaining to equality. And the only reason why Disney even spoke out in support of LGBTQ plus kids was because their cast members demanded that they do so overwhelmingly. So, you know, his behavior might appeal to a conservative base as he tries to out Trump Trump, but it certainly does not appeal to the majority of Floridians who might not always vote in every election, but do see the cost of rent going up, cost of property insurance going up, and they see DeSantis attacking Disney, just a complete lack of prioritization and desire to create chaos instead of calm. I got to say, there's a. I was in Florida this weekend uh, visiting the campus of New College. We'll have more on that later. There's a ton of fear about what could happen to that institution and other institutions around the country if the governor is successful in his efforts to effectively overhaul uh, the curriculum, the teaching staff, and the student body. Is he going to be successful? How much power do you think he can have? I know there's other legislation that could give him even more power in terms of advancing his ends. Well, you got it, Alex, and thank you for coming to Florida and coming to New College, because though New College is a small college, it is mighty, and students, alumni, faculty are fighting back and really serving as the canary in the coal mine, because what happens at New College can happen to any one of our state universities, and if DeSantis were to become president of this country, will happen to universities and colleges across Florida. And what I stressed at the rally today at New College and what I've stressed before to all of my students in state universities and colleges is that every culture war is a class war. And what DeSantis really is doing is degrading public education so that those of us like myself who grew up as a working class kid of immigrants. My mom passed away when I was 13 years old. If it wasn't for public education, I wouldn't be here with you right now. And so by degrading public education, you're basically creating a generation of young people who won't have efficacy, who won't have free thought, and will allow the status quo to remain the same, which is his end goal, which is why we have to fight back regardless of how difficult the battle is.
The Supreme Court heard oral arguments today in two blockbuster cases challenging Biden's student loan forgiveness plan as hundreds of protesters gathered outside the building calling on the court to let the White House cancel their debt. Some waited outside the building overnight, some stood in the rain, all to make sure their calls for relief were heard. One of the protest leaders said she was there because she wanted to make sure that the justices look into the eyes of borrowers. But the justices didn't have to look outside of the courtroom today to look into the eyes of a borrower. They could have turned to someone on the bench. Justice Clarence Thomas was once suffering from what he called the crushing weight of student loans. In his 2007 memoir, Thomas wrote that law school classmates suggested he declare bankruptcy after graduating because of the staggering burden of his student loans. When he was nominated to the federal bench in 1989, Thomas still had $10,000 of student loans to pay off. $10,000, which is exactly the amount of debt that Biden's plan would forgive for non-Pell Grant recipients. Now, we have no idea where Justice Thomas will ultimately stand on student debt forgiveness, but his comments today sounded pretty skeptical of the Biden plan, and he was not alone in that apparent skepticism. Justice Neil Gorsuch was fixated on the idea of fairness, whether the Biden plan was fair. What I think they argue that is missing is the is costs to other persons in terms of fairness. For example, people who have paid their loans, people who plan their lives around not seeking loans, and people who are not eligible for loans in the first place. And that a half a trillion dollars is being diverted to one group of favored persons over others. One group of favored persons over others. If you help one group, you are somehow harming the others. That seems to be the argument. Here's the thing. It is true that studies show Biden's plan would give 74 percent of the total forgiveness funds to households with annual incomes below eighty two thousand dollars. Maybe those are the favored persons Justice Gorsuch is talking about. Those families are in the bottom 60 percent of wage earners. But it is also true that the cost of college has been on the rise for decades now for everyone. And average earnings for young adults in their 20s have failed dramatically to keep up. It is also true that United States, the United States total student debt has been rising for decades and currently tops $1.7 trillion. At this rate, experts expect it to pass $3 trillion by 2035, which is just a massive volume of national debt and is something that impacts the entire country. And Biden administration officials have been warning that some of the reasons they launched this debt forgiveness plan was to address the growing debt crisis and to reduce the likelihood that about 18 million borrowers at risk of defaulting on their loans to reduce the chance that those borrowers actually fail to make their payments. Because what would a default of that scale mean for the American economy, for all of us, whether we have student loans or not? I know exactly the person I should ask. Joining us now is Heather McGee, my friend, an expert in economic and social policy and author of The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together, a new adaptation for young readers. Oh, my, my. It was just released last week. Heather, my friend, this gets to the core of the thesis you so brilliantly and urgently articulate in the book, which is this notion of zero-sum politics, right? Let's first debunk that in the case of student loans, right? You have a lot of debt that's being amassed that is not a stabilizing force in the American economy. Why do we keep looking at these things through the lens of us versus them? You know, this is a very right wing way of looking at the world. You saw the conservative justices say, um, you know, what about the small business owner with a lawn care business who didn't get who took out a, um, a small business loan? Why is that not uh, available for uh, student loan debt can for cancellation? Now, mind you, of course, that could be eligible for bankruptcy, for PPP loans, like all these other things. But just the very idea that thankfully most of Americans reject that we somehow don't live in an interrelated society, right? If you're a lawn care business owner, don't you actually want people to have enough Lawns. money to buy homes, <laughs> yes. right? And we know that there's a direct correlation between the amount of debt a family takes on and their inability to purchase a home, right? We've seen starter homes among young Americans be falling and falling and falling, partly because of this student loan debt burden. If you have student loan debt, you are less likely to save for retirement, to start a business. You often put aside marriage, right? 
this is no way to run a country. And the supermajority of the country agrees. 62 percent, according to the data I just saw, of the of voters actually think that this is a good idea. This zero-sum story that says, um, you know, resent what your neighbor has. Um, a, it's very racialized, right? We saw the images of who was organized in front of the, the courthouse steps, right? Most... Um, there's a disproportionate amount of black and brown borrowers, mm -hmm. um, which absolutely just has to do with the racial wealth gap, with explicitly racist policy that stopped an intergenerational wealth transfer for most of the 20th century, to the point where today the average black college graduate has less wealth, Alex, than the average white high school dropout. Yeah. Right. So this is one of those things we're saying to, you know, the brightest generation, the most diverse generation in American history, do all the things we've been telling you to do and just do it with twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Can we bring that graph back up? The one that shows the earnings of those in their 20s and the debt that's amassing. It's just a shocking. That's it. Back when Clarence Thomas was getting crushed under that student debt, that yep. was the 80s. That's right. Look at the look at the gap there and look at it now. I mean, that is staggering. You can't run a country like that. You can't expect people to ever get out from behind that. And by the way, we used to help people. This okay. is a really important point that you bring up in this book that is, did I mention, out in the young adult uh, uh, version <laughs> now? Here's an excerpt. Public commitment to college for all was a crucial part of the white social contract for much of the 20th century. In 1976, state governments provided six out of every $10 of the cost of students attending public colleges. Six out of 10. When the public meant white, public colleges thrived. That is no longer the case. Over this period of growth among students of color, ensuring college affordability fell out of favor with lawmakers. Hmm. When it was white people going to college, the government would share the burden. Yeah. When it became people of color going to college, the government sounds less interested in sharing that burden. That's exactly what's at the root of this problem. I call it drained pool politics, the idea that we had these flourishing public goods that created the American middle class, but they were largely for whites only. And then in the wake of the civil rights movement, you began to see this sort of repeal of all of that social contract, a draining of the integrated pools, literally in terms of swimming pools, but also figuratively in terms of the other kinds of public goods like free college, which, frankly, most of the members of Congress right. actually, you know, we did this study at, at Demos where we looked at the members of Congress, they were paying hundreds of dollars in tuition. And now, of course, it's tens of thousands of dollars a year in tuition at the same schools. And that's because we have not kept up the promise that having an educated citizenry is important to our economy. It helped to create the American century and all the research and innovation that we just sort of take for granted as part of the American birthright. As we're falling behind in global competitiveness because our young people are saddled with debt, where our peer economies are looking at what we did in the 50s and replicating it for their <laughs> They're young like, people. we'll take America, yeah. but 70 years ago. Exactly. I just, how do we bridge this? Because on one hand, you have the us versus them narrative, which is very prevalent and powerful in Republican politics, and the anti-elite narrative, which is you don't need no college degree. You don't need to go to those elite institutions, right? I mean, how do you, I mean, I know that your, 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 your stats say 62% of the country, but the, the, there is a sharp partisan divide on this. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's any way of bringing back some part of the GOP that understands the importance of education and understands crushing debt. I think it is, this is the thing, there's um, a lot of like play acting around populism on this issue, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Ron DeSantis, you know, he went to Yale, right? And he's and like, Harvard. Ed education for me and not for thee, right? Um, but fundamentally, most working class families, if you ask them, do you want your kid to go to college? They will say yes, yes, right? Because that is a core part of the American dream. And we have so many jobs that are working class jobs today that have some college, including community college, which used to be free and which the Biden administration would like to be free and is not today. And people go to debt and get go to community college and get tens of thousands of dollars in debt. And so I do think this is not a sort of plain and simple college educated versus not issue. Um, the average uh, income of where the majority of student loan yeah. debt applicants, you know, relief applicants were, you know, is like less than $50,000 a year, right? We are talking about working class communities that, of course, if you just think about it for just a second, 
had to borrow to go to college because they didn't have a trust fund yeah. and intergenerational, intergenerational wealth to rely on. And so that's who's hurting the most. And this, the American government needs to invest in its future. Oh, American government. Read this book, American <laughs> government, The Sum of Us. My friend, Heather McGee, thank you for your time. The book is out in YA versions That's now, right. so your children can read it before they go to college.